Jessica Castro. Um, you mentioned uh, some provisions of the law which you think uh, have an impact on the freedom of religion. Uh, freedom of religion. That's correct. Now, um, uh, uh, on another matter, it seems that uh, when light begins, it's no longer a religious matter in so far as the Constitution is concerned. Because the Constitution has elevated this to a constitutional principle that life begins from conception. That's correct. Now, uh, from scientific studies, it would, it would seem that uh, the um, fertilized ovum or the fertilization of the ovum occurs in a matter of minutes and that the uh, fertilized ovum undergoes a series of development of and by itself yes, Your Honor. before it is implanted in the um, uterus. Now let's go now to the definition of abortifacient under the law. Uh, it says that uh, abortifacient refers to any drug or device that induces abortion or the destruction of a fetus inside the mother's womb or the prevention of the fertilized ovum to reach and be implanted in the mother's womb upon determination of the FDA. Now, um, abortion is not defined here as to what is meant by abortion, which is induced. The, it is followed by a phrase referring to a fetus. So clearly that does not refer to the fertilized ovum. Now, and the third part refers to the fertilized ovum which is prevented from reaching or be implanted in the mother's womb. What about the um, condition of the ovum from the time that it is fertilized up to the time of uh, implantation which may take many hours or perhaps days? Why didn't the law simply say that uh, an abortive patient is one which will destroy the fertilized ovum? That's a good definition, Your Honor. But uh, the, the, it would seem that the law is more restrictive. It refers to the prevention of the fertilized ovum to reach and be implanted in the mother's womb. So it, it would seem that it is not protected before the time of, it, of implantation. Is that a fair um, uh, interpretation of this provision? That it is not protected? Before and implantation? It is not pr protected because it will not be covered by the term abortive patient. So it, is, it will not be an abortive patient if the ovum is destroyed, the fertilized ovum is destroyed before implantation. Uh, I do not see that in the law. That, uh, um, don't you think it's, uh, this definition is very restrictive? Or do you think this is a fair definition of uh, an abortive patient? The law could have if it, if it if it destroys the, the fertilized ovum before implantation, it will not be an abortive facet. It it will be, Your Honor. If, you, if the will that be will will your um, interpretation be supported by this definition? It it appears not because what the law says is prevention of the fertilized ovum from reaching the uterus to be planted in the uterus. But what you're saying, uh, Your Honor, is a destruction mechanism before the, uh, the uh, zygote reaches the uh, uterus. Uh, of course, they can say that that is covered by the, the, that definition in the, uh, in the law, Your Honor. Because the, the, the law, to be clearer, should have simply said that, that an abortive patient is one which destroys a fertilized ovum. And that's it. That's clearer, Your Honor, I think. Okay. Um, I think we should find out... Uh, the uh, intent behind this provision of the law, uh, which um, does it really um, outlaw or consider an abortive patient one which will destroy a fertilized ovum before it is implanted? It should be covered, Your Honor. Okay. Now, um, let's go now to the definition of uh, reproductive um, rights. Among others, the law says 
to attain the highest standard of sexual health and reproductive health. <coughs> now, if you go to the definition of reproductive health, uh, among others, it implies that people are able to have a responsible, safe, consensual, and satisfying sex life. Do you understand what is meant by satisfying sex life? Well, I have my own ideas, Your Honor. And, and uh, that uh, idea may differ from person to person? Yes, probably in terms of degrees and uh, preferences. <laughs> uh, how do you relate uh, uh, the use of contraceptive pill to enjoying a... Uh, to enjoying a, or to, to attaining a satisfying sex life. I think what the law means, or at least the authors, is that if you have sex without consequences, meaning you remove the consequence of pregnancy, then probably their premise is that you will enjoy the sexual act more. So it would seem that uh, since the law is directed uh, to the poor and the marginalized, so the pill will enable them to have sex any time of the day and night? Without pregnancy. Without pregnancy. So is that a compelling interest? Is there, what is the compelling state interest to be served by that? I don't see anything, uh, any compelling interest, Your Honor. Will this um, intrude into the realm of um, privacy, the right to privacy? Uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor? Will... Uh, will um, this uh, provision of the law yeah. intrudes into something which is too private and personal. I think matters of uh, anything inside the bedroom should be off limits to government. Okay. Now let's go to another provision of the law. And, uh, this is about uh, the uh, criminal liability of doctors. Uh, let's go now to the criminal liability of doctors. Now, doctors are uh, prohibited from, from refusing to extend the quality health care services and information on account of a person's marital status, gender, uh, or age, among others. That's correct, Your Honor. Uh, will this not uh, impair the... Uh, the um, doctor's uh, exercise of his uh, profession, if um, he considers um, the age of a woman to be a factor to consider in providing contraceptive? Yes, I think that, that should be a major consideration, but the law will not allow uh, the doctor to have that. There are studies which... Uh, would show that um, uh, young women who have not experienced first pregnancy are under greater risk of yes. uh, uh, incurring illnesses because of the use of contraceptive. Yes, according to one study, up to 60% uh, risk to breast cancer, Your Honor. Now let's go now to um, paragraph A2 of section 23. Um, it says, um, while it refers to a person of legal age, in subparagraph uh, II, doctors are not allowed to perform, uh, to refuse to perform legal and medically safe reproductive health procedures on a minor in the absence of a written consent of their parents or legal guardian. It would seem that um, doctors are compelled to, to um, give contra uh, dispense contraceptives to uh, minors even without, the consent, without finding out if the um, parents or guardian consented to the use of contraceptive. Is that, I, is that the uh, implication of this provision? There is a qualification, Your Honor. I think uh, parental consent will not be required if uh, the parent is an accused on an offense against the minor. 
It says here, parental consent or that of the person exercising parental authority, where the parent or the person exercising parental authority is the respondent, accused or convicted perpetrator, as certified by the proper... Um, that is under the first sentence, but you go to the next sentence. In, In the case, case of minors the written consent of parents or legal guardian, or in their absence, persons exercising parental authority or next of kin, shall be required only in elective surgical procedures. Yes, Your Honor. And in no case shall consent be required in emergency or serious cases, as defined in the law. Yes, Your Honor. So, uh, barring any of these exceptional circumstances, there is no need for proof that the parents or guardian consented to the use of contraceptive by minors? Yes, I agree because uh, the provision speaks of elective surgical procedures. So if the minor only wants a condom or a pill, it seems, it seems like uh, the uh, healthcare provider will have to, to oblige. Okay. I have no further question. Okay, uh, Justice De Castro wants to add. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I'll go back to Section 23, Paragraph A, 2, and II. What, did you say you agree that uh, the provision here about minors is a surplusage? Why do you say that? Can we? Do you, what do you mean by that? That this is a surplusage here? Are you saying that we will consider this as not written in the law? Well, this is not what, what among, I, I don't think this is one of the provisions that we no, raised. You were asked whether the, you consider this as a sur surplus age, and you said yes. What do you mean by that? You mean to say we will not consider this as part of the law? Yeah, if there's a way to harmonize all, all the provisions, that's a basic rule of statutory construction, Your Honor. Uh, on the other hand, uh, don't you think that the term legal age here is the one which is negated by the two paragraphs following that uh, that introductory portion of Section 2, it refers to legal age in the beginning of the paragraph, but the subsequent two, two subparagraphs refers to minors, and the provisions are very clear. Even married couples can be minors as long as they were given parental consent. So even I can cover uh, minors, not only uh, persons of legal age. And paragraph Subparagraph II refers to uh, minors, clearly refers to minors. How can we say that uh, these are um, surplusage in the law? These we are submit your parts of the law which refers to minors. And uh, this prohibits uh, anyone who would require a written consent of a minor who wants to be, who avail, to avail of uh, uh, contraceptives or family planning methods. And if you consider that in relation to the other provisions of the law, it says that any violation of this act will be penalized by imprisonment or fine. It would seem that uh, this provision will come into operation if, a, uh, if anyone refuses a minor to be given any planning method or contraceptive um, device because of the absence of written consent, that person can be liable under this provision. And it is not up to us to say that uh, any provision of this law is a surplusage unless we say that this violates the Constitution. That is the only time we can say that this law can, this provision of the law cannot be applied at all. We submit, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. We will uh, be, uh, have attorney... You are excused, uh, Council, as always. Thank you, Your Honor. We will have Attorney uh, Ghana for the next session on uh, Justice Mendoza, what date? August 3, 2 p.m. Afterwards, we will uh, immediately proceed to the Solicitor General and the uh, other uh, respondents. Your Honor, is it possible for... Senator Tata to give a very short closing. 
Uh, pl please no, let's not vary. We always discuss even the procedures on this. Sure. If you want, you can make a manifestation, but uh, we will uh, follow the advisory and then uh, we will, uh, we will uh, face it when, uh, when the time comes. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, th uh, there being no further comment from any of my colleagues, the session is hereby adjourned. All right. Please remain in your respective places until the Chief Justice and the Associate Justices leave the session hall. <laughs>